the webinar where we talk about how brands can help get involved in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, my name is Afdal Aziz. I'm coming to you from Venice Beach in California. Um, I'm joined by my partner in Conspiracy of Love. We are a brand purpose consultancy. We work with Fortune 500 brands like um, Adidas, uh, Oreo Cookie, Red Bull, to help them figure out how to find purpose and also to then activate purpose as well. Uh, and uh, I'm joined by Bobby in, in New York, in Brooklyn, who is my partner in purpose in conspiracy. Hi, Bobby. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are also joined by our special guest today. I'm super excited to announce Sarah Capers and Robert Jan DeHond from, uh, from Kantar Consulting. Hello, Robert and Sarah. Hello, Abdel. Uh, Good to hear Rob your voice. Robert is coming to us from a sunshiny Amsterdam today. It looks like you're going to have a good weekend with weather there. So hello, thanks for joining us. And Sarah is joining us from Brooklyn. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. So happy to be here. Excellent. OK, cool. So we've got some we've got them presenting a super interesting survey of purpose driven campaigns from brands. Kantara has been analyzing 45 different campaigns to look at what's working, what's not working. Uh, and it's going to be, um, I think, riveting stuff. So stick around for that. We're going to kick off with them. And then joining us from Seattle, we have Jeff Colon from Microsoft Advertising Brand Studio. Hello, Jeffrey. How are you? Hey, Aftel. How are you? Hey, Bobby. Good, thank you. Yeah, good, good to you. join. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's going to be super fun. Jeff is going to talk about some research they have on, uh, on how people are behaving right now. Uh, they put together a really interesting survey in co collaboration with Susie, which has some terrific insights on consumer behavior and the trends that are out there. And then last but not least, we have Will Butler from Be My Eyes in Los Angeles. Hi, Will. Hey, how are you guys doing? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Will uh, is the uh, VP of Community at Be My Eyes. If you don't know what Be My Eyes, it's an amazing platform. It links the blind and low-sided community there's 400,000 people using it, or 200,000 people using it, with 4 million sighted volunteers who help them with everyday tasks. It's a remarkable platform. I've been a big fan of it. And Will is going to talk to us today about what's going on with the, the blind and low vision community, and also how brands can get involved in helping um, this community get access. Will uh, Be My Eyes works with Microsoft, uh, with Google, with Procter & Gamble. Um, and so thank you for joining us today, Will. Super excited to chat to you. Always good to see you. Cool. All right. So uh, right throughout, you can send us questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there. Uh, please send them through. And Bobby was going to be collating them right throughout. And then we're going to save 15 minutes at the end to chat uh, with each of the panelists and talk about some of the questions you guys have sent us to so keep them flowing in um, as we, get, we come throughout it. Directly after this, we are going to send out a recording of this video so that everybody can view it uh, in full. And we can also send out all the presentations you're about to see uh, as a Dropbox link, which you can access as well. So stand by for that. All right, let's dive in. So uh, Robert and Sarah, um, I've been a huge fan of the work that Kantar has been doing uh, on purpose ever since your groundbreaking Purpose 2020 study, which came out last year. If you haven't uh, seen it, guys, highly recommend you go and download it. It was one of the most insightful frameworks for how companies adopt purpose and how it's a competitive advantage that I've seen. I, I cite it all the time. And so uh, when you reached out and said, hey, we, we've done an analysis of purpose-driven campaigns. Do you want to know what's going on? I was like, yes, we do. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, why you guys decided to commission this, this in the first place. This is back in 2019. You started thinking about this, right, guys? Yeah. And what also with Purpose 2020 learned is that the why of purpose is not the comp most complicated piece. I think it's widely understood by now that the power, but where most of our clients struggle with is still on the how. How do you get it rightly executed? And we touched upon already quite a little bit in, in, in the Purpose 2020, not how you just do the articulation, but how you infuse it, but also how you mobilize beyond. Mm -hmm. But still, there was more questions still coming from the industry, still nagging on, on, on the why. And also the, the ARF, the Advertising Research Federation said, can you really help us even more narrowly? What are good purpose executions and what not? And, and what can you help us guide and learn? And that's the, the piece of work we've been doing over the last few months, which indeed was 
planned to be released in June, but as the learnings are so meaningful, even for the times of COVID, they decided to bring it forward to last week. And that's why we now can talk about it. Yeah. And, and Sarah, do you feel like this topic has suddenly gained a new relevance right now? The idea of not just what purposes, but how to successfully activate it. Do you think it's more relevant now? I mean, I think it's as relevant as it was before and purpose is even more relevant now. So the fact that you're going to have to learn how to activate well is absolutely true in this moment. You don't really get to do it in a different way. Um, so it's important to know how to do it well. And the same learnings apply in this moment as they did, you know, pre-COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay, cool. Well, let's dive in. Please fire away. Please share your screens with us. We'll walk through it and we'll right. have a quick chat after this as well. So I oh. will share my screen. You will share and, and, uh, and I will start talking uh -huh. um, to, to save time. So basically, there are in fact two pieces of research we, we want to share. So one is indeed, you know, the one about activating purpose and, and what to learn from it, but also want to share some highlights from the piece of research, which is the COVID barometer, which is a Kantar global survey over 30 markets over 25,000 people, where we on a weekly day basis really measure people's attitudes and, 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 and perceptions towards brands and, and, and COVID. And those two pieces of research, we, we want to answer two questions today. Should brands respond to COVID and, and be specific mm -hmm. about the unique situation? And then obviously, how should they do it? I will take care of the first question and then Sarah will take the tough one and go deeper into the how you should do it now if you ask people bluntly um what brands should do then eight percent of the respondents just eight percent said brands should not advertise so you know they really expect you still to be alive and kicking um uh, in these times but it gets a bit more interesting to see what do they then expect you know, a third would say they should support hospitals brands or over half would say brands should support the government or 75%, you know, is about informing brands about your brand and about your company, what you're doing to face the situation. So just talk how you behave as a company. And finally, also 75% says, talk about how your brand or your product is meaningful for me in those times. So there's really, if you need to answer the big question, is this a time to step up or to step back? It's definitely a time for brands to step up in doing so. Now, this is obviously um, should not come as a surprise because this, this, this trend that brands should step up beyond themselves as, as, as the product delivery they do. We know, and, and most of the audience here is quite immersed in, in the whole purpose thinking, is, is there already for, for, for quite a while. So it's typically something, you know, a trend which was there is now more amplified. And again, there's a lot of data indeed talking about that indeed it is expected that we play bigger brand, bigger roles with our with our brands. And again, the COVID data survey barometer shows indeed the appetite is there. Or if we put it a, bit, a little bit differently, which you see on the next slide, is indeed now we're entering what we would call the area of the public. Um, and I think there's a build on oh no, it. It's the, anyway, we are now entering the area of the public. Um, playing a role in, in COVID is really meaningful because you know it started with the marketing area of the product. So what's about product safety and superiority? Then it was about the area of the persons, and you know it was not the product, but also what you do for them as a person with functional and emotional benefit. And now, what do we contribute next to those layers to the the public domain? And again, in COVID, this is really meaningful as we see, you know, the response of institutions get very mixed and even disorganized what the town says or the state says or the government. And therefore, in this area of the public, what the new marketing framework is, brands talking about uh, purpose, but also talking, you know, unique situations as COVID is really meaningful. So that brings to the question, how should brands do that? Because we know from purpose, you can go really wrong and you can go really right. And that's the task of Sarah. Yeah, I'm, you can hear me, yes? Very good. <laughs> okay, um, so ultimately it is about acting with purpose. And as we sort of set up before we started talking um, through the presentation, we 
sought to, to figure out how best to, to do that in conjunction with the ARF um, at the end of 2019. We, we had a lot of clients coming to us and coming to the, the members coming to the ARF saying, how do we do purpose well? And we went, we wanted to understand kind of what are the best in class strategies that we can employ to do purpose marketing well and execute effectively. Um, and in order to arrive there, we gathered a cross section of campaigns. So we wanted to look at campaigns that were big. We wanted to look at campaigns that were kind of small from, from large brands, small brands, from really successful campaigns and also less successful campaigns um, and across different industries so that we could really have a representative corpus of material that would be our baseline for analysis. And then we analyzed those from across multiple lenses. We looked at how this connects to the brand itself, what it's res responding to in larger culture, um, kind of how it represented people and their needs and the impact it had both on society and the brand. And we coupled that analysis with in-depth interviews with campaign owners to understand what is the climate um, that all of these you know, brands and agencies were swimming in that enabled them to successfully activate on purpose. And it was that baseline that um, informed our key findings. And we really sought to distill all of the learnings into a very actionable, straightforward framework that brand owners could apply. And it came down to you, them, and the world. You being yourself, them being the people you seek to serve and your fans, and then the world is how do we really impact. A, a purpose campaign doesn't do any good, um, isn't any good if it doesn't do any good. So the, the world has to be central to every single purpose campaign. So you, them, and the world. And that's what we're going to dive into today in how best to activate purpose. So starting with you, how do you do authenticity well? I think we hear the word authentic pretty consistently um, when we talk about how, how to you know, best show up as a brand, but, but how do we make sure we do authenticity? And one of those things is having precedent and others connecting to the core of who you are. So what is your core brand proposition? And then if you do those two things effectively, effectively a good gut check is, you know, does it feel like an obvious move in retrospect? Um, and the EBA initiative, um, the Equal Vehicles for All initiative by Volvo, really did these three things. So they recognized that most cars were designed for a adult male body and um, Volvo believing that cars should be safe for everyone, publicly released 40 years of safety data that applied to all body types so that the industry could use it. And this had precedent because they did the same thing with a seatbelt. Um, in 1959, I believe is the, yeah, 1959, um, they invented the seatbelt, but instead of patenting the design, they decided to release it to the public so that everyone would have access. There was a very strong precedent for this campaign. It connected to the core of who they are. I mean, Volvo is, the, their differentiating kind of factor as a brand is about safety. And so doing those two things together meant that this was an obvious move for them in retrospect, a smart one, um, but a very obvious move. But it is not all about you <laughs> and your campaign should not be all about you. It is also about them and in executing, it is very important to partner with the people who care, to let them wherever possible tell their story. So centering them as the heroes and giving people something to do, provide a platform that they can action themselves. Um, and a great, a great kind of illustration of this coming to life was the MGM Universal Love campaign. Um, they recognized um, at MGM that some of the entertainment industry is not as inclusive of LGBTQ plus folks, um, especially when it comes to the lyrics of traditional love songs. So they created an album that included um, that, that shifted the genders of the artists in order to make them more applicable to queer couples. And when they launched this, they partnered with the people who care by going out to the artist community and having conversations to sort of vet the idea with LGBTQ artists. 
And then they let them run with it. They let them tell the story by choosing the songs that most resonated with them and letting them produce them in the way that they kind of saw fit. So really letting them bring it to life. Um, and this cam campaign also gave people something tangible to do. It was an album you could download and listen to with your partner. Um, and then they also did experiential activations that including a, a karaoke um, pop-up for the 50th anniversary of Stonewall where you could select the pronouns that you wanted to sing your love song to. And lastly, the world's, but not last, right? Definitely super, super still important to have at the forefront of your mind. Um, you really need to be doing something good. So solving a problem, tapping into culture, changing conversation, solving for a cultural tension, and being in it for the long haul. Like the world's biggest problems were not created overnight, they won't be solved overnight. So really committing for the long term. Um, the Patagonia Fight for Public Lands campaign was, um, you know, uh, Patagonia as part of their preservation efforts over, a, you know, many, many years um, has tried to protect public land, including Bears Ears National Monument. Um, it sought to solve the problem of protecting the land from government privatization. Um, they even brought a lawsuit against the president um, and the Trump administration. It tapped into culture because it was really um, connected to the rising resentment towards the administration, especially around environment, environmental issues at this time. And they were also in it for the long haul. So they weren't, they weren't just trying to use this moment to, you know, make a big claim against the president. They had been trying to protect Bears Ears National Monument during the Obama administration when they'd been part of a lobbying group. Um, to protect this public land. And um, it was actually the year of this campaign launch, they had intended to sort of unveil all of their efforts um, that they had, that they had, you know, this had become a monument because of their, their work. And at, at the end of the day, they were back to protecting it. So they were, it was really about being in it for the long haul that they'd started this, they'd achieved what they wanted. And then when it came under threat, they went back to continue protecting it. Um, so again, really doing something for the world and for today and tomorrow. So we're seeing this in the COVID reality as well. And it doesn't, just because we're in a sort of new moment doesn't mean we don't still wanna follow these same foundational um, practices of being you, so doing something that feels deeply connected to who you are as a brand. Um, Nike, we all know Nike, their purpose is to unite the world through sport. I, I actually can't think of what would have been a better way of doing that and bringing that to life in a campaign during this moment than their play inside play for the world campaign. Empowering the individual um, to, uh, the individual athlete, to literally play for the world. So, so connected to who they are as a brand um, and, and really feels distinctly Nike because of that deep connection to who they are. In contrast to the, every COVID commercial has, is exactly the same <laughs> clip, which you may have all seen. Um, so th those are the commercials where there's the same kind of music at the beginning that's, you know, looking at the world we're in and the same, we're all here to help. And then the same sort of, we're going to get through this together, which doesn't tap into the distinctly you part of your role and what you have to say in this moment. It's just saying something rather than having something unique to say, um, which is why all, all campaign, all brands at this moment, when they're thinking about how do we activate, need to really reflect on who we are as a brand. What do we uniquely bring? How do we leverage that for something distinct? Because at the end of the day, if we don't, it will start to look like everything else and isn't really going to do that much for your brand. Centering everything around them, letting them really you know, participate and do something. So um, this was brought to my attention actually by Aptel earlier this week. Um, the Teeks, which is um, best known, they are a ballet flat company um, and they 
really spurred a movement with their hashtag so together uh, operation so together campaign so they encouraged folks at home to make masks and to donate them to their local um to, to uh public health organizations in need so any any place that had a need for masks and then they gave people gift certificates up to hundred dollars worth of gift certificates um for sewing and donating those masks and they have donated nearly or over half a million masks at this point and have created an entire kind of movement on social media of folks sewing together, of contributing, of using their their kind of time well in quarantine to contribute positively to the world through this platform that Teeks provided. So really centering all around them of empowering them to participate, to solve the problems. Um, and you know, with gift cards, they're now able to try the brand, right? For the first time, you're gonna have new folks thinking about Teeks. Um, so it's great for the brand too and making a huge impact and also empowering people to feel like they can make a difference in this moment, um, which I think you know we can all resonate to how daunting it is out in the world right now and how we want to actively participate in making it better if we can. So Teeks has provided a platform to do that. Um, in contrast, so Yelp really also, I think in, in good, um, good intentions, wanted to help their small businesses on their platforms to, you know, weather this very challenging economic storm um, with, you know, um, so much less demand. But what they did was they created, auto-created um, fund, fundraisers for all of their small businesses and without without involving them. So this was kind of the, the, the inverse of this tenant. Um, they didn't ask them to opt in and they went about it kind of without, um, without consent and without incorporating and including them in the process. Um, I think this could have been a really powerful initiative if they had encouraged, opt in, had people opt in, encouraged them to participate um, as opposed to Yelp just running and doing it for them. Um, they have since added in the um, opt-in kind of factor of this. So businesses can have a fundraising page if they would like, um, but it now incorporates them in the process rather than the brand going about it and doing it themselves. And lastly, the world. So there are so um, many challenges to solve for right now. Um, there's so many problems that we can all see that need help, whether that's PPE, um, you know, mobilizing people, and brands who are stepping up to actually solve those problems are doing it right. So HP quickly um, mobilized their technology and their 3D printing to manufacture um, PPE and part and equipment for healthcare parts um, for hospitals, and they're doing that at the industrial scale. But they've also already donating thousands um, of parts to in need areas, both in the US and in Spain. But they've also made these hospital grade designs available to anyone. So they're universally downloadable. And it has meant that individuals have been able to download those and also bring, like donate them. I actually have, my partner has picked up um, multiple shield downloads um, from people who have 3D printed them and they're literally being shipped to hospitals. Um, shipped via her car, sent, <laughs> picked up and sent to hospitals. Um, so these are ways that people can participate in solving this very, very critical need today. Um, and HP is exploring how to operationalize this so that they can make it sustainable for the long term. Um, for brands that aren't participating, like, you know, it's, it, we said it in the beginning, this is the most important moment for brands to begin activating on purpose. And when you don't do it, it really just, comes off tone deaf. And that's what happened with the fried chicken and chill campaign. You know, I don't think Popeyes was trying to activate on purpose when they launched this campaign, which was, you know, take a picture of yourself with fried chicken and we'll give you our, if you're one of the first 1000, we'll give you our password for Netflix. Um, nothing wrong with that idea as a campaign, but in this moment, it just didn't land. And that's because it didn't address the kind of cultural moment we're all swimming in when when all of the challenges are so visible that a brand didn't didn't do something meaningful um it's like do the chicken and chill but also do something meaningful that they didn't address that um really just didn't land with consumers so 
this is the moment if you're not already thinking about purpose and how you can make an impact on the world for the better. Um, it's the moment. It's the moment to start thinking about it. Robert, I'll pass it back to you. Very good. So if I just wrap it up in, in the last slide. So I think the core learning we want to get across to you is that brands should stay in their swim lane to be their true you, but that definitely within that, a real desire for, for the audience uh, to step up and involve them and, and, and rally the world. And to get yourself ready for that, we see always two critical tasks you need to achieve. So first, obviously, you need to define what we call your public role to play your role in the area of the public. What is your brand purpose? What is your bigger impact? So you can to be true to your North Star. And then it's about activating it. Again, not just about yourself, not just about the world, but really on the you, the them, and the world framework. And then with, with the them as the amplifier, you can really rally a much bigger impact as a brand. And that's what the world needs today and tomorrow. Cool. Fascinating stuff, guys. Thank you so much, Sarah and Robert. That was, uh, I, I have so many questions. If you have questions, by the way, please send them to us via the chat function or the Q&A function. Uh, and we'll get to them at the end of this, uh, this webinar in about 20, 25 minutes. Um, all right, let's keep moving. So um, Jeff, let's turn to you. Uh, first of all, explain to everybody, what is the Microsoft Advertising Brand Studio for those of people who, who don't know? Yeah, thanks for asking that question, Afdel. So we basically work with um, customers, clients, um, non-customers alike, basically to um, you know, activate interesting campaigns, innovations, um, that uh, tie in a lot of the research that we have um, in regard to advertising. So, you know, if we have interesting research on where people are, what people are doing in terms of communications, how do we bring that to life to inspire uh, people to think in, in new ways? I mm. think, you know, we're always looking for that. Even, um, you know, what someone was asking me recently, you know, do you think that's relevant even during a time right now? And of course, I came back with some data saying that every innovative company or offering has happened during an economic downturn because mm -hmm. people become more creative. They mm -hmm. try to find things uh, with less money and they try to do things with less money uh, and, and, and find solutions. So I've, I've been, you know, sort of busy trying to figure out, you know, what are those next solutions? What could they look like, uh, especially if you're at home? You know, how do you bring the shopping experience uh, to someone's living room? Um, how do you, you know, think about how we discover things in, in a new fashion? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of really, you know, interesting platforms that are out there. And it's funny to watch them, you know, take off because, as you know, Ofdel, they're, they're, they're all remixes of, of the past. You know, mm -hmm. these, these, these things that people get excited about in terms of, hey, I was invited to an exclusive meeting that only, you know, 12 people were in. And I said, hey, that reminds me of the, 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 the phone party line from the 1980s yeah. or maybe going to a rave in the 1990s. I mean, all this exclusivity that people think is, you know, new on the internet has already yeah. existed. So yeah. those are things that we are fascinated with watching and seeing how that plays out into, you know, new forms of advertising. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's uh, tell us a little bit about the the survey stuff you put out there, and then let's dive into it. Yeah. Please go ahead and talk. To, you yeah. Know. Yeah. So, um, you know, before I, I I share some slides of some data, you know, what we were looking at and what's really interesting to us were, you know, what are like the most important factors right now for you know brand purchase? We're in a we're in a we're in a unique situation in the world right now where. Um, we did want to know like, hey, what is motivating people? Because that then uh, that I think if brands understand that they can tailor their messages, communication, their, um, you know, even their supply chain management, uh, you know, strategy around where, you know, uh, people are right now, where their behaviors are, where their, um, where their consumption is happening. Um, you know, the, the second question we, you know, wanted to ask is, you know, where is that purchase behavior? Where is it happening? You know, there's a tendency of many of us as armchair strategists, I like to call, to say like, oh, you know, hey, physical stores are now gone because no one is interested in going out and, and shopping. You have to look at that in context now, Opdel, as we've seen that, yes, online shopping is up. 
but physical stores are still important because a lot of people still rely on them to buy groceries. So obviously that's not an area that's gonna go away even if someone says, hey, I've been ordering my groceries online and they're delivering them. A large percentage of people still rely on physical stores to, to do that. Um, in fact, we've uh, in, um, sort of uh, identified um, a trend called BOPIS, B-O-P-I-S. That's buy online, purchase, uh, or pick up, sorry, buy online, pick up in store. Yeah. So some more marketing language for all of us to take away and say, oh, geez, another term out there that, you know, is going to stick. But uh, that that is something that we've seen. The third one is, you know, how important is a brand's, you know, COVID-19 communication strategy when it comes to branding? Because if you, if you think about it, there's a tendency of many of us in marketing and communications to say, oh, I don't want to hear anything about COVID-19. I mean, I think all of us may be familiar with, there's a video circulating around the web showing how every COVID-19 television yeah. ad is the same. The thing is, marketers are going to make fun of that. But, but regular people, people who we depend on to actually support brands, they actually are very interested in COVID-19 communication strategy. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we dive in, we'll re we will realize that... Um, that basically 40% uh, want to hear more from a brand and a company on what their COVID-19 strategy is in terms of protecting that company's employees, mm. as well as what how they're going to protect the customers. So these are all interesting things that we might say, oh, wow, I don't know if messaging is really important. What we've What we've actually discovered is Messaging is important at this time. It's just that it has to be clear, it has to be concise, and it has to be simplified. And it is on things that maybe would fall to, you know, a public relations team at a at a company is now has to get involved, which is, hey, what is our what how are we going to yeah. basically talk about how we're protecting our employees? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing for companies to or, or for consumers to say, um, I want to purchase from, from that company. Uh, but what we're seeing is in the research is a, a, a large percentage are interested in what's the what's that company doing on the back end to protect, you know, me as a mm. customer, as well as as the employees. And that ties into purpose. I mean, that's yeah. a whole thing that yeah. we talk about. I mean, so, you know, let's dive in a little yeah. bit to some yeah, of these, these slides, basically. Cool. Um, yeah, here we go. So. Um, on the on the first um, one, which basically is asking the question, and we did this research with uh, Suzy, uh, which is a really great um, uh, software as a service research company that we partner with a lot of, with at Microsoft. You know, we were we were curious on like what are the areas that are important in terms of factors for uh, you know what makes people purchasing you know want to purchase right now and 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 the reason this is important is because again I think it we can tailor our our brand strategy around this um, not surprisingly discounts and offers and free shipping were the top two most important factors for non-essential uh, purchases now why is this important one I think this is the area for a lot of brands who may not be known, they may not be known by an, a number of people to actually um, increase their brand strategy so they're discovered by more people. So, uh, you know, one way that they could do that is through discounts and offers and free shipping. One thing that we did see also on here is that, you know, fast shipping has really actually come down. So for a long period of time, there were a number of companies that were saying, hey, we're going to try to figure out how to get, um, you know, materials to people um, that that same day that there's less interest now because I think we're much more patient as humans and we're actually just looking for hey I'd rather take the free shipping or the discount to discover what your brand is look at some of the sampling efforts one thing that I thought was really interesting here and you know not to scare us is environmentally friendly efforts were sort of lower on the scale but you have to look at that in context right now I think on the back end, people aren't really thinking about that as much as COVID-19 related efforts. That's really sort of like front and center. I think, you know, when it comes to environment, uh, the environmental friendly side of this perspective, if we ask these same questions 
in a period of time when, um, let's say, COVID-19 is in the rear view mirror and, not, and less of, a, less of a, a threat or a risk, that might increase again, because we have seen that in a lot of uh, interesting research um, you know, from the past that that was really, that that was really important. So those are things I think, you know, for companies in terms of how they can use, you know, maybe free shipping or discounts and offers to be discovered by people who don't use their brand. That's really important, um, you know, in terms of, of, of discoverability. The second area in terms of, you know, where is that purchase behavior? So in the last four weeks, we've seen some interesting, you know, uh, activity. One is, uh, we asked the questions, you know, have you spent more than you typically do in a particular area? Do you spend less in a particular area? Or are you spending about the same? And what we've found is that um, where people are spending basically more is, you know, through social media. So a lot of people who are getting basically targeted advertisements on social media, they are clicking on those and actually trying to discover uh, brands a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Search engines are a huge factor. Still, we haven't seen any real dip in activity. In fact, I think the lead time in research is is uh, has increased because people do have a little bit more time to actually research things and figure out, you know, what they need. And then the other areas uh, is basically online retail sites, which makes sense. These are your Amazons, Jets, Targets, and Ebay's of the world. So we have seen obviously purchase behavior uh, in those areas basically uh, increase. Where we have seen people spending less uh, is obviously on the physical store side or the online brand side. Again, not saying that physical stores are, are, are you know, in trouble here. It's just that more people have shifted maybe buying specific elements from uh, online in terms of like groceries and things like that. That's still a huge area of, of importance in terms of how people go about um, uh, about purchasing. So, uh, you know, this shouldn't really come across, you know, too surprising to see, hey, search, social and online uh, retail have, have increased. That's interesting. I think the, the, the one golden nugget here for brands to think about is, you know, what is their brand site uh, going to do what we've what we've seen at least uh, some growth on on that is people spending more there than they typically do is you know how do brands actually build the digital storefront of the future so they may rely less on retailers uh, this is interesting because obviously from you know uh, a brand messaging side of the spectrum you can get more of that across if people are actually coming to your digital storefront than you're going through a third third party. And, and, and you know, Ofdel, it's interesting now because we're in a world again where I think there's going to be a battle between some brands and the retailers that they've used. Uh, we're starting to see this in a number of different industries, uh, the movie industry being one, you know, they don't necessarily want to go through partners of the past, like movie theaters to uh, distribute their product. Um, it sort of reminds me of a remix from the early 2000s when, you know, you had um, digital music, uh, basically, you know, causing friction with physical stores that were selling music at the time, the towers, the Virgin megastores, et cetera. I think we could be in the same sort of area when it comes to, you know, purchase behavior, um, you know, in, in those areas. Uh, brand discovery differed a little bit for men and women slightly. Um, you know, what we were seeing in some of the, some of these areas is, um, women were, were buying more from uh, social media posts. Uh, men were actually asking more friends and family recommendations. Uh, I, you know, I would actually love to know based on this, you know, it might be a follow-up question that I ask in research is, you know, where was, um, you know, how are men basically asking those questions? You know, are they asking basically their friends and family through digital channels and then doing digital research? I mean, these are things that again, it's hard to figure out what the overall customer journey might be, but um, there is, you know, a little bit of, uh, of difference in terms of, of uh, uh, discovery based on uh, based on gender that we that we found. Hey, Jeff, real quick, uh, just sure. to mention, you, yeah, some of your slides may be getting cut off at the bottom, so I'll let oh, you know. Oh, I'm sorry, but it's okay. Let's keep going. I'll I'll keep you posted. Okay, sounds good. The, um, the, so like the, the, the big sort of takeaway that we found from, um, 
you know, how important is a brand's COVID-19 communication strategy is uh, the, the sort of two nuggets here is 27% purchased from a brand specifically due to their COVID-19 response. So again, if we think about what a, you know, a brand's you know, mission or purpose was in terms of their communication, that's a pretty healthy fact. That's a pretty healthy number here in terms of you know, how many actually saw a message around this and said, hey, I'm going to actually uh, investigate that brand. And then 40% of those consumers appreciate the brand's message to the public. So um, regardless of all of the marketing speak that we see out there on, you know, hey, how important is it to communicate what um, a brand's message is? Uh, you know, this is basically uh, a decent number actually to look at in terms of, 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 of how important that is. I, I think the other interesting data that we had was that 95% will continue to buy from these brands post COVID-19. So I think this is an interesting opportunity for a lot of brands to be discovered if possible through a lot of their messaging. And um, you know that, that's, that's an interesting discussion. I think a lot of marketers, PR representatives, brand managers should be having, because this again, I think is, is something that's long tail in terms of you know, the situation that we're in, how to, and, and for each company, it's a little bit different, you know, how will this play out and how will companies continue to communicate on that is, is very interesting. One other thing I wanted to bring up is 37% will stop purchasing from a brand that is not sharing communications around the company's COVID-19 policy to keep employees and customers safe. That's 37%. And Opdel, we know based on how social media and Twitter and Facebook act, that 37% could become 90% in a matter of hours, depending on how brands particularly behave. I think they are more under the microscope now than ever. And people are really, you know, sort of questioning, hey, what is the ethics of that brand? Uh, and I think that is an important thing for us to, to you know, to continue to note, what is the ethics of, of some of these companies? How are they treating uh, their employees, how are they treating their customers? Are they basically having a very transparent communication strategy? Um, I think those are interesting, you know, discussions for for companies to have. So, um, as basically, uh, you know, I noted here. Sorry, I didn't. I wasn't showing the actual slide itself, but you know, I think I think the the big take takeaway here is that uh, seventy percent of those who purchase from a brand as we said, um, um, of a brand specifically because of their response to COVID-19 are purchasing either new brands or a mix of new and familiar brands. I think we're seeing some of this, um, this uh, retro or novelty factor right now. I think when people are over inundated with a ton of uh, decision-making, they, they, they sort of turn to who they depend. I think that's one reason why we're, we're seeing a lot of brands who uh, have been around for quite a bit of time. If we look at our sort of word cloud here, uh, where they're where they're where they're basically saying, okay, hey, this is I know that brand. I depend on that brand. They make sort of good products. I'll just I'll sort of utilize them. But I think there's the ability for you know, if we look at the mix of new and familiar, there's the ability to basically go after a, a lot of uh, if you're a new brand, you know, how are you discovered right now? If you're a challenger brand. What are the moves that you can make that basically call more attention to, uh, you know, what you're trying to do at this at this moment in time? So those are those are interesting factors um, that we you know we basically have. And then of course I just want to call out that we have a ton more data um, that we collect at uh, Microsoft Advertising from you know our search activity on Bing, um, and we've set up MicrosoftAdvertising.com/slash/COVID. If anybody watching the the webinar today wants to just go and look at some of the COVID-19 data that we have out there in terms of how brands are behaving, how consumers are behaving, what things they're searching for, what what how verticals have basically changed, uh, you know, areas that uh, I think we want more more and more people to tap into. So, cool. you know, again, pr appreciate the uh, opportunity, Ofdel, and yeah, uh, you know. It was a lot of fun in terms of, uh, you know, it's a lot of, uh, it's very interesting, I think, to continue to watch as behavior evolves yeah. uh, over the past, you know, eight weeks. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Jeff. We'll be, Thank sure, you. We'll be sure to circulate this deck, by the way, to everybody 
um, uh, so you can get all the data and insights again. All right, cool. Let's move swiftly onwards. Last but not least, Will Butler from Be My Eyes here in Los Angeles. Hi, Will. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, it's it's nice to see you again. And uh, first of all, let's just jo- let's start by talking a little bit about your own journey uh, with, with you know to be my eyes as well. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, Will, and and how you came to be so passionate about this topic. Um, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. So um, for context, there are the World Health Organization estimates there are 2.2 billion people living with a vision impairment right now. And I'm one of them. I use a white cane when I'm out in public. Um, I use assistive technology. I use all the accessibility features on my Mac. I wasn't always that way. It was a process that I had to learn like more than 90% of the people with vision impairments. Um, And so my journey to be my eyes was just sort of a a natural one. And um, when I realized what the company was doing, I kind of took a lot of my accumulated experience in journalism and writing and um, the nonprofit field. And I was like, let's try to figure out how to take this global community of uh, blindness support community and turn it into something long term sustainable and something that's going to have a big impact on businesses. Yeah. When it's having an amazing impact on businesses, I think you're going to talk about how you work with brands like Microsoft. Um, and uh, Google and Procter and Gamble as well. So yeah, let's dive in. Let's learn a little bit more about Be My Eyes, and we can have a discussion at the end. Terrific. And shared some stuff as well. Share my, share my slides here. Yep. Um, can you guys see them all right? Yep. Wonderful. Oh, good. Um, Perfect. All right. So um, as I said, so today I just want to share a little bit about what Be My Eyes is and how we uh, not only impact the community that we, that we, that we work with, but how we work with brands to take a concept of small acts of kindness, small steps um, to have a big impact. And it was really interesting as you all were talking, I mean, everything you said totally resonates with what we're seeing when we partner with a brand. Um, And what we do really is sort of a full circle solution for a lot of companies that are trying to figure out the how, right? They're, they've, they've already decided the why, and they're trying to figure out how do we have this impact. And not only, you know, the, do our solutions implemented by brands, but they're implemented by HR departments, they're implemented by customer service teams. Um, we try as much as we can to not just be um, explaining our purpose, but to actually just be every day creating direct connections between brands and consumers that are going to have really meaningful impacts. So um, I'm going to, let's see here. Yeah, so a little bit about um, Be My Eyes and what we do. Very simple concept. The Be My Eyes app is a free mobile app. It was invented by a blind Danish craftsman named Hans, who came up with the idea about six years ago um, when FaceTime was getting big of, what if I, when I needed a pair of eyes, I could just FaceTime someone out in the world who was ready to help me? You know, he said, every time you, as a blind person, every time you walk out into public, practically somebody tries to help you. And you don't always need help when you're walking around your familiar setting. But um, oftentimes when you're at home by yourself um, and you need to read a label or do something Um, that is out of your normal routine. You just need a pair of eyes in your pocket. And that's what Be My Eyes offers. Um, Today we have uh, a community that is approaching 4 million. Um, We have 3.7 million volunteers assisting hundreds of thousands of blind users around the world in nearly every language and every country where the internet is freely available. Um, The app is available on Android and iOS and we are the biggest community of blind people in the world. As you saw, as you could hear from the 2.2 billion number, we're not even close to penetrating the market of potential, you know, this this massive, massive community of people with vision impairments. And long term, that's our ambition. So what are people using Be My Eyes for? People are using, here's a kind of grid of some of the most common use cases. Um, I might call up uh, to have someone read me a label, to have someone uh, check to see 
um, that my clothing, I'm wearing the purple sweater instead of the blue sweater, um, navigating unfamiliar situations, a lot of technical help, um, a lot of help in the kitchen and cooking, but people are super creative with Be My Eyes. Um, one time a, a blind man found a, uh, a call to volunteer and said, I'm hearing some strange noises in my backyard. And the volunteer looked out into the uh, yard and said, I don't see anything unusual. I just see your dog. And, and the guy said, I don't have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next question the guy asked was, well, does he look friendly? Uh, and the volunteer said, yeah, okay. So he helped him approach this dog. And with the help of the Be My Eyes volunteer, just holding his camera phone, he, the blind man was able to read the tag on the dog's collar and return the dog to its owner, which is a task that is not only totally unpredictable, but would be totally inaccessible to a blind person otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to talk a little bit about, though, briefly, uh, the impact of the sit current situation on the blind community. Blind uh, people are already have an unemployment rate that's just through the roof. I mean, even in the U.S. alone, it's like 70 percent. It's a low income population. Um, and we really rely on tactility and human connection and our support networks to do a lot of what we do. So even though medically we're not at any higher risk because of COVID-19, it's had a huge effect on our community. Um, you can't safely walk around a grocery store and keep a six foot distance from someone. Um, students are finding that their educations are inaccessible because suddenly they're being thrust into this digital climate where accessibility hasn't been considered in many of these new platforms. Um, there's uh, tons of barriers when it comes to uh, just basic things like entertainment, I said education, getting basic things like food security. And, um, and we frankly worry that if we were to contract COVID-19, that um, there's a fear of going to the hospital because it might be, we worry that our quality of life might be assessed to be lower than those without a disability. And that's the sad reality of our situation. Mm. So I wanna show folks a little bit about how the app works and I'll come back to what I was just talking about. So basically what we, it's a free app, everyone downloads it on their phone. And this is from the blind user's perspective. Blind folks, if you don't know, access their phones a number of different ways. I access mine through magnification. Many folks access theirs through a voice layer that comes with the phone. Um, others might even use a braille display. Um, a refreshable USB braille display, or Bluetooth braille display. So we give people the options to either call a volunteer or call for specialized help. And then this is where you start to see interacting with some of the brands who are offering specialized services. Microsoft was our first partner and they've expanded so much to, so as to allow um, to offer Microsoft tech support 24 hours a day, seven days a week to the blind community. Um, so that means that a blind user can actually press the specialized help button for Microsoft and go directly to a trained Microsoft representative who knows how to work with them in their assistive technology to help them out when that maddening Windows update happens in an unpredictable time and, and uh, the screen reader goes off and, uh, and, and Microsoft is there to help our community. So we've started seeing, this is a little bit about what what is, what is it about, you know, how do we keep this going and how do we underwrite this amazing global community that offers free site 24 hours a day, seven days a week to everyone in the world. And this is where our partners come in. So as I said, Microsoft was our first one. Google also offers technical support on the platform. Um, 16 hours a day, I think they're open. Procter & Gamble's loading brands on to s support with everything from hair care to, you know, any, any P&G product you can imagine. Um, we've worked with banks in the past. We've worked with uh, all sorts of brands that are using Be My Eyes to not only connect with and support directly at a human to human level, blind people, um, but, to, but to tell stories and to share how their products actually really sincerely do impact the lives of blind people. We also have a whole number of like corporate volunteering experiences that we can use to sort of activate the team and get them excited. Um, those are sort of internal tools. We have work tools that if you have blind employees that you can offer to them so that they can use the Be My Eyes technology internally at work. And, um, and, uh, it, and they also make you much more appealing 
as an accessible employer. So um, I'm just gonna run really briefly through, you know, here's a list of campaigns. These slides will all be available. Everything mm -hmm. from, you know, how Google's helping people do more to how partnership with a clear blue pregnancy test can allow blind people to finally get their results privately and anonymously because before blind people were asking strangers <laughs> or friends and family to tell them if they were pregnant. Um, so uh, accessibility is a journey, it's not a destination. And I'll go through this quickly, but this is where, you know, we've tried to develop tools at Be My Eyes and solutions that fit every step of this journey that leads you to being fully inclusive. And it's, that's inward facing and outward facing. It comes from supporting customers. It comes from changing the culture your, of your brand through vol volunteering. It comes with um, making sure you're boost, helping chip away at that 70% 70 uh, 70 unemployment statistic with our internal tools. And eventually it's this goal of total inclusion, which is not an achievable goal. I just wanna be clear about that. It's not a 100% thing. It's like perfection is what you're striving toward. It's a worthy goal, but it's a journey and it's, it's, it's really not just a sprint. Um, so what we do is we, co we come to brands, you know, whether it's a clothing brand like a, or a, a whatever it might be, you know, a wine company and ask them, what is your experience that you can offer the community? What, what way can you support? If you have wine expertise, why don't you help us in the wine aisle when we're trying to pick amongst all of these inaccessible wine labels and we just want to get that bottle open and have that sensory experience? Um, maybe it's J. Crew who wants to help people look through their closet. Maybe it's Red Bull who wants to people ha help our blind community have an adventure. There's all sorts of potential on this platform, and we've sort of only cracked the surface of what it might uh, mean for your brand. So I, I hope I kind of give give a good overview, but I also wanted to leave a couple minutes at the end in case anyone had questions about what we do and uh, how you can kind of be extra helpful and really directed at the at the blind community during this uh, this time of COVID-19. Hey, thank you so much, Will. That was super fascinating to learn. I think every time I think about the fact that you have, you know, 200,000 users and 3.7 million volunteers, it gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. I think that it's, it's this remarkable thing about human generosity and wanting to help, you know, so, and, and it's terrific to, sh yeah, to see how that can apply to this community as well. Um, I'm going to turn over to Bobby because I know we have a few more questions and I, I want to make sure we get to them. Uh, Bobby, go ahead, fire away. All right. Um, uh, for Will, just a quick follow-up to your presentation, which, which we all love. What, what's the biggest uh, misconception about the Black community that you would love to be able to correct? Uh, for totally blind. Sorry? That they're, that they're totally blind. Got it. What, what, is what is that? 2.2 billion people in the world living with vision impairments. Only, only tens of millions of them are actually fully blind. Perfect. Love it. Um, Sarah and Robert, um, as you as you look at your work um, and as brands begin to uh, lift out of the the COVID nineteen uh, focus uh, and begin to lift up and start thinking about the future of their brands and what this is gonna look like, not just for the rest of this year, but 2021 and beyond. Um, what's the biggest piece of advice that you would, you would give them in, in terms of planning and, and thinking about what a post COVID uh, world is gonna look like in terms of how their brands should show up in it? Well, two pieces of for advice. So first we would say, take a scenario planning approach because it's so unpredictable how the world in four or 10 or 12 months from now will look like. So what we work with our clients is really think for some extreme scenarios, how could the world look like and what should be your response? And that's the best way uh, to prime. And then we typically look through the lens of how consumers behave, how institutional uh, institutions will, will interplay and how consumer behaviors will work. So work on those scenarios and, and build through your, your response plan. And then the response plan always starts what you do with your own organization, your brand and your, and your, your own community. As you saw in the data, people are really interested how you treat your own employees and how you treat your, your own community. So have a plan for that one first. 
and then secondly think through what you can contribute based on your high level purpose um, and doing it meaningfully in the new world. Sarah, any builds from your end? Yeah, I think I would just add it's if you're not clear on the kind of what you want to be contributing to the world above and beyond what you sell, get really clear on it now. But this is the moment to get really clear on that so that it's going to guide what your brand does and it's going to guide what you start doing today, but it's going to also guide what you're doing a year from now. Um, that what, once that's really firm and foundational, there's a, a, a clear playing field about the direction you're going to go. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Af, I know we're right at time. Do we have time for another question or are we, are we at time? Yes, let's do one more. Okay. Um, Jeff, I know you are uh, both a uh, historian when it comes to culture as well as someone who's uh, very passionate about what the future will, will hold. Um, as you're looking at this whole landscape and the things that you're seeing from, from uh, consumer trends, I'm curious what you think as, what, you, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for disruption uh, right now based on uh, what consumers uh, and people are, are looking for? Uh, what brands have been doing in the past that may no longer uh, match up with those expectations and what you're seeing in terms of, you know, how technology is being used. What do you see as the, the biggest area that's ripe for disruption uh, moving forward? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a big question. Um, I think, you know, the interesting thing is how, uh, how do brands now uh, disrupt like the least amount of things possible. So I guess, how do they provide stability at the moment is really important. People are really looking for stability in terms of, um, you know, what they go about and, and do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, are there ways to improve how someone connects with your customer resource uh, management team? Do they have to jump through a bunch of hoops to, to do that during, you know, time, you know, times before people just sort of dealt with that. Now they, they don't want to deal with that. They want to be able to get into a queue to talk to a, you know, customer service representative. Um, so, you know, how are you providing that type of stability just with the fact that there are more people working from home. So they're really relying on a lot of people to uh, help them navigate this world. I think also another interesting thing, Bobby, is, you know, how do brands also just let people interpret their products, solutions, and services in a way that, um, you know, maybe the brand doesn't say like, hey, that's not what we're, you know, trying to get across, but actually looks at how people are using their, um, you know, their solutions and says, wow, that's interesting. We didn't think we would, you know, anyone that would ever use it in that way. Uh, and as long as it's not harming anyone or anything, you know, have we, you know, is that how they find innovation in this, in this, in this new era? So, you know, how are people uh, doing things at home, um, you know, would be really interesting. How are they using some of the, uh, of the, of, of the products and services and solutions in new and unique ways? I think that's the, uh, you know, what, how do they say it? You know, we, we're given two ears and one mouth for a reason. So I think um, mm. beyond just all the communication that a brand does, how much listening can they actually do during this time to say like, hey, we learned a lot from this sort of, you know, turbulent period. Here's how we're going to go improve our services, our customer service, our products, et cetera, for the long tail. You're here. Amen. Um, well, thank you, guys. Thank you, Bobby, for the questions. I think we're at time now, so we're going to let everybody go. I just want to thank Robert and Sarah from Cantar Consulting, Jeff from Microsoft Advertising Brand Studio, Will Butler from Be My Eyes. All three of these presentations are about to become available via the Dropbox link we're sending out right now. Um, thank you to everybody tuning in. Again, be safe, be well. Don't forget to look after each other, and we'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Okay, bye for now. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Bye-bye.